you're far too kind with your words. Uh, but I think where you're right is I, I do like to kind of work in the, in the background quite a bit. Uh, and I work as, as a freelance. Just to add to that, to tell you where I'm coming from uh, is, so I, I suppose 80s, I used to have a small holding and, and I've always been a keen grower of food and I still am whenever I have time and we just walked around here and it was really interesting looking at the, the five acre farm. Uh, but then I was quite involved in setting up civil societies, uh, a, a training centre, networks and that kind of thing. Then, I don't know if it's because of my nature or whatever, uh, I, since 99 I've worked uh, freelance. We actually call ourselves free rangers. Uh, there's a group of us who meet every so often and, and uh, try to think of ourselves in that, in that way and look at our practice and how it works. So since then, but I mean, I also realized that there were a lot of small local civil society organizations coming up during that time. Uh, and they were really struggling organizationally. So that's why and I'm not an organizational development expert, but I mean, some of it's just about sitting down, making time, stopping and thinking about what you're doing. And, th and that's really what I do with organizations. So the last 20 years, I've been traveling a lot in East and Southern Africa. So I'd say most of my work's in East Africa, but quite a lot in, in, in fact, the last few years with the Seed and Knowledge Initiative, which I'm now part of, with, in Southern Africa. Uh, so that was my, I, I was looking at the title of this seminar and thinking, that's a bit arrogant of me to put that up like that. But it's kind of bird's eye, what I thought to, because I'm thinking about it all the time, where, where are we with agroecology? So I've been involved for a long time in trying to take it forward. And I mean, we weren't even using the term agroecology until fairly recently. Uh, so where are we? Where do we need to move forward? So that, that's something that I'm always thinking about. And I'm privileged in that I can see a lot of work going on. I work with a lot of community-based organizations. So I get into, into uh, working with communities, but also with... Uh, networks and farmers' organizations and national. And, and I've been quite involved in the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in, in, in Africa, which is a kind of a, so Pelham is part of that now. It's a, it's a network of networks. It's a continental voice. So I was involved since about 2011 as they were doing the groundwork to set up. Uh, and it, before I go on, I just want to say it's really nice to come here. Uh, because for me, I think what we're doing is all about relationships. It's all about action happens where there's strong relationships and where people really work together. So it's, it's very nice for me to, having heard about and hearing a lot about the center and being excited about its existence, and, but it's still this thing up there. Now, now it's real. Now it's really real. And, and uh, Michelle kind of kindly invited me when we were together in Uganda a couple of years ago, say, come and visit. So I thought to, to do just that. So I'm, it's, it's a kind of bird's eye view of where I'm seeing agroecology in, and it's mostly East and Southern Africa, but I have been in West Africa, and I, but I don't know it nearly as well. But I, I know quite a few people there. Uh, and it, yeah, it's coming from, I suppose, I'm, I'm challenging, my, my kind of job is with organizers to challenge them to, to do better, to be more strategic, be more collaborative. So it's, as, as agroecology, how can we do that? How can, we, where, where do we need to go and where do we need to move? So if we, we think of agroecology in those three, and I mean, for me, the whole agroecology and the term and the, has been really positive. It's brought a lot of work together. So Pelham was kind of a bit, like that. So we use this term, participation, rather a mouthful. I don't know if we'd do that again, but it was, the whole thing was to try and bring, so all these different methodologies and practices and PRA, and this was back in the late 80s, uh, no, the back in the early 90s, uh, permaculture, holistic management, and various practices and so on that kind of tend to, probably for good reasons, get a bit stuck in themselves. So this was, we set Pelham up to try and keep moving beyond that, keep thinking about the bigger picture and, and where do we go. And I think agroecology has really added 
uh, and brought a lot of people together under an umbrella. It's given a home to a lot of work. Uh, so if th it's often talked about in terms of being a science, uh, a set of practices and, uh, and, uh, and social movements, the pol uh, political economy dimension of it. So looking at those three aspects, I mean, what, what I see in Eastern Southern Africa is, and I think back to the late 80s when we were setting up the Fambids and I Center, I mean, we were considered off the wall, really. I mean, that was the height of the Green Revolution in Zimbabwe. It was this, this incredible success for smallholder farmers, taking up what the white commercial farmers have been doing, and wow, what a success, the, the, the bread basket of, of Africa. So and we, was, we were challenging that. Uh, so we were really off operating on the periphery. I mean, now we're not. I mean, it's changed a lot, that. And I mean, I kind of have to remind people, if things seem bad, it, it, at least people now accept agroecology. They may not call it that, but accept that we have to manage uh, ecologically. And more and more people are accepting. I mean, I just bump into a lot of people, but they may not be practicing it so much. They all those lock-ins that are, they're tied into and so on. But it is, it's very different from what it was, uh, whatever that is, 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And I think that that's positive. And, and, and the, the potential is so much bigger uh, than it was then. Just people, particularly around climate change and, and nutrition, I think. Those are the two areas. Uh, nutrition is, yeah, just diabetes in Zimbabwe was less than 1% in 1980, and it's now more than 10%, which is, which is phenomenal. And, and, and the Ministry of Health statistics keep reporting that uh, child ma uh, malnutrition and linked to it stunting is over 30%. So those are sort of official figures in, in I mean, it's just really shocking. So, and then of course, climate change. So, so everyone's talking about climate change. It just, and agroecology responds to that. So I think, I think there's, there's this amazing potential that, that we're, and one side of me is, one side of me is very frustrated, but one side of me is very excited at this potential that's there. Because of a kind of, an, it's difficult to gauge how widely spread that, this sort of awareness of, an, of a need for different way of farming, different food systems. But it, it's there and, it's, and it's, it, it really is growing. Uh, and I keep being amazed by that. Uh, but I mean, also, the one big thing looking at it in terms of a science, there are very few African scientists who are trained in understanding it or have that kind of mindset or just that competency amongst the scientific world in Africa in terms of agroecology is, is very, very low. Uh, again, I'm not, I can't give you specific data, but, it, but you, you, you can see it. The mindset, particularly the mindset, is still, people have been through that conventional training. It's, it's extraordinary how they can't uh, just see things in, in a more holistic way. So th there's a sort of positive and negative, but looking at the, the practices, as an agroecology set of practices, for, for me, I'm a bit worried. Uh, because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of that, and agroecology has provided this umbrella. But it's still, I would describe it as kind of bits and pieces. There's lots of bits and pieces going on. There's, there's, there's a lot going on in terms of nutrition gardens. I see that a lot. And, healthier uh, food being produced, produced in that sort of more intensive area. There's, it, it, there's a lot more in the sort of easier climates of, of East Africa, of Kenya, the higher rainfall areas where more people live, Uganda, or sort of, for me, they're like, coming from Zimbabwe, they're like paradise. So th there's more where it's easier to do. Uh, and, there, and there's really no reason why it can't just take off there. Uh, but overall, I, I, yeah, I mean, the cropping areas, for example, I, I just don't see many practices out there 
that are really, really revitalizing the soil. Uh, there's some using organic and growing organically, but they're just not, not the examples in the sort of dry land cropping areas. Uh, there's there's the, the whole conservation agriculture, uh, which, is, which is essential in a way. I mean, it, it, a friend of mine, Henry Elwell, did, did research in Zimbabwe years ago, and he showed how quickly in that seasonal rainfall environment the organic matter drops when you plow. I mean, for me, in the longer term, plowing is just not, but everybody plows. Everybody still plows just about. There's some work with the conservation agriculture, but it's been taken over by uh, the, the use of, I mean, in Zambia now, apparently, the use of glyphosate and other herbicides is really shooting up uh, as a result of the, the conservation. So it's, so the more building the soil conservation agriculture isn't really happening. Uh, so that, that, that's a way, and I think that there's a lot of work to do there and, and, and how to do it and how to get examples that is, is, is a challenge. Uh, we were just talking about the rangelands. Certainly in southern Africa, I don't know what the exact figure is, but we talk about 80% of Zimbabwe being rangelands. Very few people working in rangelands. They're just heading downhill. Uh, there are some doing work around planned grazing. And that, but it, it's di really difficult work. It's slow, difficult work. It's, it's about building community. It's about building relationships and trust and all sorts. I mean, livestock are such an important thing for people. And so that, that's an area uh, where I think a lot more needs to be done. Uh, I, think, I think there are a lot of individual farmers out there innovating. But I don't think there's enough recognition of innovative farmers. There is some, I mean, probably Nova. Uh, I've been involved in some work around recognizing innovative farmers and, and using that, their innovations as, as, as a basis for learning. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, when, it, when we think agroecology as a set of practices, there, there, there's the basis, and, it's, and again, it's different from 30 years ago, but we've still got a lot lot to do and a long way to go. And I, I think we really need to focus on trying to develop some, some good examples. Uh, so in the rangeland management, and I mean, of course, rangeland management links to, to cropping areas and we can do it. We, we, there's, there's some pretty good work in Namibia uh, going on. It's a bit way out for people to go to. I mean, people have been from Zimbabwe. But I think it, it's so important for, for, to have those, those first examples that are really working well. And those, those will, is, that's what will inspire farmers more than anything. Uh, when it comes to, to, to agroecology as a social movement, uh, as a, a, yeah, the sort of awareness side, the linking, the networking, Certainly what, what's improved since 30 years ago is there's a lot more networking amongst civil society organizations, what I would call kind of professional civil society organizations, people where they're working and they're paid for what they're doing, NGOs and that kind of thing. Uh, and that's good. That's great. Uh, and that Pelham was, was, is, is an example of that. AFSA is an example of that. And I think, I think that, that that's really positive and, and much better than it, than it was. Uh, but where, where we still need to do a lot of work is around citizens' voices. So the voices of farmers. There are farmers' organizations, but it's, I don't know Latin America well, but I think we're a long, long way behind Latin America in terms of having farmers' voices. We do, I mean, I think a lot of damage has been done over the years by some of, sort of maybe some of the bigger international organizations in terms of setting up groups and when they leave, these groups fall apart. And so, but there is quite a lot at, at, a, at a sort of community basis, farmers' groups and, and some of the savings, the, 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 the savings uh, and loans groups are quite inspiring. Uh, not in Zimbabwe because our financial setup makes it very difficult, but like in Kenya, there's some pretty impressive local savings and loans. 
clubs and the amount of money they, they have and, and so on. Uh, so, yeah, but then linking that to a higher level and linking that to a national level is, is tough. I work very closely with Zimsof in, in Zimbabwe, uh, and I'll be meeting with them again in September to talk about how they move forward. A great bunch of people there, and they're, they're hosting La Via Campesina. Uh, but it, it's, the, it's real tough work, that. Uh, and the danger is that you become more like a farmer NGO than a farmer's membership driven. And they, they, they're well aware of that. Uh, then in terms of, of eaters, uh, eating eaters groups, consumers, or whatever one calls them, yeah, that, that's, so in, within AFSA, we're starting to focus on that quite a bit. Uh, and there's some interesting, again, local initiatives, food fairs and promoting local foods and traditional foods. And, and th there's this huge awareness that I think we could tap much more. Uh, but still, not, not really the, 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 that, that voice, the associations, the, the, the sort of citizens really driving things. So I think that's, that's a big challenge for us going forward. Yeah, so for me, what I try and encourage working with different organizations is, is just, and I suppose, being, being more strategic. So the word strategic, and I, I hate strategic plans. Uh, but just being strategic, being really thoughtful about what one does, finding leverage points. I think that's what we have to do, because we resources are small, uh, and I should link with a little side story here with about Michelle. And, and that's another issue, if you want issues, looking at the overall picture, is that the whole promotion of agroecology is being supported by a largely very inappropriate financing setup. I mean, it's a it's about being strategic. It's about being innovative. That's what we need amongst people who, who are promoting agroecology. We, we badly need that. We're, we're looking, the potential's there, but we've got to keep finding different ways. And we have this ridiculous system of, of, of log frames and having to predict what you, you, you achieve in four years' time. I mean, I, I see it. I see what it does to small organizations. I mean, some organizations that are confident and big, they can play the game and they can sort of deal with it, play the game, and still remain innovative. But the smaller local community-based organizations, they, they really struggle with that. And then they, they just put their heads down. They've set up these indicators for four years' time. It, so anyway, that's another whole struggle, which I'm sort of partly, how do you manage in, in complexity, partly linked to trying to change how funding happens and to have more trust-based funding, because I think that's the kind of funding we need. But whatever happens, I think we need more resources. <laughs> we, 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 we need the, the, the support of science, uh, and you need, you need resources for that. Because uh, basically science across Africa, I suppose the world was hijacked by industrial agriculture. So we need to take it back, because I think it's important to have that in our, in our work. Uh, but whatever happens, we, we, we'll never have many, so we'll always have few resources. <laughs> And th that's what we have to work with. So I think we have to really be uh, strategic in how we operate. And that, that's really what I try and do now, is think of strategic openings and look and try and kind of sew from the background people together. So I'm quite linked now with, with as you know, there was that cyclone in, in mostly hit Mozambique, but it hit a couple of districts in Zimbabwe, one of them which is, is Chimanimani, District and I've worked there for quite. I used to live there once. Uh, I, I think there's an amazing and actually, yeah. So there's a research. They're meeting tomorrow, today and tomorrow. In fact, there's a research which cause is 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 part of in in in, in the background uh, to look at what happened in that cyclone uh, and all the different aspects of it. But I think coming out of that, what I hope is that for me that's an amazingly strategic opportunity agroecology now because you've had a situation where it's about managing whole landscapes 
it's people need to manage their whole landscape, and they, they've experienced. I mean, the trauma was what people went through. I was there about three weeks afterwards. It's it been a very traumatic experience uh, for that district. Uh, and I think people will be up for, for looking at how do we manage our landscapes. And, and, and there's no choice in a way because those cyclones are coming back. So I would hope that we could really develop something, a big program there, uh, big in our terms, that brings a lot of different people together, working together, uh, and designing and looking at community processes. Because there's some I haven't mentioned, but there's some good work around uh, re-linking people, culture, to nature, and linking to traditional practices that always, across Africa, sacred sites, all that sort of work. There's, there's a lot of good work. So we bring all the different things together in, into, into a process and, and have it well documented, well evidenced, and so on. Uh, and also with another example, just to give an example, is I've been working in, there's a district in Zimbabwe called uh, Gutu. And there, a friend of mine, his, he's, comes part of the traditional, his father was, was, was the chief there, uh, but he's been working in town. But he, with working with other people on the ground, it, it, it's amazing, with no funding at all. Uh, he's, they, they've really brought back to the district the growing of finger millets uh, and the value of finger millets. And it, it, it's been in, and it makes so much sense. I mean, just this year they had field days where maize had failed completely and the fig, finger millets had produced. And they want to take that forward now. But they've sort of, across the district, they've got a kind of social network of people. Uh, and to me, there's, there's a real strategic opportunity now. So they want to move it more towards, so the focus has been bringing the finger minute back. It hasn't been so much on, on the agroecology, but that's what, where they want to take it. Because it links with their the thinking about being more self-reliant. And they, they, they went back to elders and said, after fail, uh, maize failing again and again, how are we self food self-reliant in the past? And the, and the elders said we grew finger millet. That was always the food security crop of this area. So, so the whole process grew out of that. And so there's a, there's a sort of mindset there. And they've got government working, government extension agents working quite well with them. So I'm just saying that as, there for me is another example. And I was up in, in Uganda recently in Kibale district and just watching how a, an, an NGO there is working with, with schools and how well linked it is. Uh, I think there's a real strategic opportunity there. And I think I'm, it, it's kind of district level. That's where I see our opportunity to really promote, not national. I think sometimes we try and change things at a national level. Too. It's really difficult at a national level and trying to communicate. But at district level or county level in Kenya or whatever the unit is, there are about 50 districts in Zimbabwe to give you a sense of the size. There, there's a, there's a real opportunity, and, and I think it's that sort of work that that I, I hope more and more people will start to <coughs> to focus on. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. I've sort of jumped about a bit, uh, so I suppose in summary, I'm just saying th 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 there's loads of potential, but we've just got to collaborate more. And and uh, and be more strategic in what we do, and, and pick it out, and yeah. Anyway, it's easy for me to say that I don't have any organisational affiliation, so I can challenge organisations all the time, and I do, to just work together more. So, shall we kind of open it up to a bit more discussion? That gives you, I don't know, a little bit of a taste. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.